what we have to do now, having understood what kinds of justification um, is necessary, and we, we are going to outline certain broad, general ways of justifying what constitutes a moral or an immoral act. I mean, basically it's a moral act. And when is an act moral? When is it immoral? There are certain very standard theories. Maybe you are familiar with them. If, that, uh, if you are familiar with them, that will help me because then I can telescope my, uh, my, you know, my presentation even more. What we have here, what is for this session, outlining teleological approaches to formulating a criterion for moral action. Um, are we familiar with the word teleology? No? Okay. Uh, basically, there are two highways, if you like, expressways or broad roads of theories with respect to what constitutes a moral act. And one high road or one big broad avenue is a set of theories which we will call teleological. Now, this comes from the Greek word telos, which means goal. Goal or purpose, okay? And another set of theories, uh, which are called deontological, come from the Greek word deon, which has a reference to duty. So one is purpose-oriented, goal-oriented, consequent-oriented, if you like. Consequences play a major part in teleological theories. And to refer back to what uh, my colleague Pravesh said, he says they are structured basically in the if-then kind of situation. If you want this to happen, then you must do this. So if you want to be happy, then you you know, you be moral. If you want uh, uh, to be uh, fulfilled, then you be moral. It's structured in that way. I mean, it's goal-oriented. So somebody could possibly say, no, I don't want to, and then opt out of the moral game, so to speak. So these are conditional in that sense. Teleological theories are in that sense conditional. And why it is important to emphasize this is because of the deontological theory that we will uh, talk about, at least I will talk about it, uh, Kant, who took a position directly against this. And he says morality is not a matter of if this, then that. Morality is categorical. There is no conditionality to it. If you want to be happy, then you be moral. It's not a question of what consequences you want to follow from your particular approach that is going to determine the morality. The morality has to be determined by whether it is your duty or not. We shall see that. I'm jumping the gun on that. So teleological approaches is what my concern is today. And there are two major theories with respect to that. One is called ethical egoism. And the other is, you probably heard this phrase at least, utilitarianism. You've heard of that name somewhere. Utilitarianism, polysyllabic word. But um, we'll see very shortly what it means. Ethical egoism is a theory that is recommending a course of action as moral, yes? It's not telling you that um, do, meaning it's not saying that I should do whatever brings me the best consequences and everybody else can go to hell. I mean, it's not advocating selfishness. It's saying if you want to be moral, this is what you have to do. And what you have to do is to try and promote the maximization of your own self-interest. And it's not saying that only for me. It's saying that for Mr. Nasruddin. It's saying that for, you know, for everybody else. You should promote your self-interest. Uh, Tom, Dick, Harry, Mary, and Jane, everyone should be promoting their own self-interest. Basically, that is what the theory is saying in a nutshell. What utilitarianism is saying, as distinct from that, is that we should try and promote the interest of everybody. 
which includes yourself. They are not cancelling you out from that everybody. You are part of everybody, but you are not more than any and any other body. In other words, you count, but you count just for one. That is the dominant, uh, if you like, the distinction between ethical egoism and utilitarianism. Both of them are emphasizing that we should try and maximize our satisfaction. Okay? But ethical egoism will refer it back to the self, not just myself, but everybody's self. If I am to decide what is moral for me, I must see what brings me the greatest satisfaction. If you have to decide what is moral for you, then you decide according to what will bring you the greatest satisfaction. You might have problems with this. We'll, we'll go very briefly into those problems. And utilitarianism is not saying that. It is saying that everybody should aim at the general satisfaction. Okay, let's, let's start with those kind of things. But even before we go into that, maybe I'll spend just a little time talking about a theory which really is not ethical in, in any sense of the term. It is more a psychological theory, which is uh, called psychological egoism. And that theory says something that you and I will probably empathize with rather immediately. As a matter of fact, we always act to promote our self-interest. That is what the theory is saying. And it's saying even more than that. It's saying we can do nothing but promote our own self-interest. Now, that is where the radical claim of that theory is, OK? Because if, if that theory is true, then we might as well close up shop on all kinds of ethical theorizing. I mean, then don't even uh, you know, talk about ethical egoism, utilitarianism, or any other theory. Because if all that the human being can actually do is only seek his own interest, what is the point of saying anything else? That he should do anything else? Or even what is the point of telling him to seek his own interest? That's redundant, no? It's like saying, you know, if you walk out of the window, if somebody chooses to be that adventurous, please ensure that you fall down. So, but I'm going to fall down in any case. There's no point in telling me to do what I am going to be doing in any case event. So if that is the only thing I can do, then it is a very devastating kind of blow to any normative ethical theory. So the point is how, how genuine or how much, um, how much can we uh, accept this position? Doesn't it seem an attractive position? That this is the way human beings are. Don't we seek our own satisfaction in everything that we do? It seems I mean, put this baldly, you might say, no, 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 you know, of course, sometimes we are concerned for others. And then the psychological egoist springs the trap, so to speak. He says, yes, of course, I'm not denying that, you know, you do actions for others. But what is the motive of your action? You want your own satisfaction, ultimately. You can spend a life service, you know, in a leper colony taking care of the sick, but why are you doing it? You are doing it because of the satisfaction you get for yourself. So they move just one step uh, off the path and say, fine, if you're saying that, you know, we do acts that are so-called altruistic, they'll say, we admit it, true. Of course we do acts that are altruistic. But what's the motivation for the action? The motivation for the action is always self-oriented. Because we get satisfaction from doing it, that is why we do it. And the issue is, so what's wrong with this? I mean, we should welcome such an attitude. Because, just supposing, you, um, the so-called non-egoistically oriented theories, why should they you know, get up in arms against a theory like this? Isn't it better, isn't it better, that if you are helping others, you get satisfaction out of doing so? You will continue to help others, no? Rather than if you didn't get satisfaction from helping others, and yet you had to do it. So the non-egoistic theories which say, let's say, who want to be altruistic, you know, you must help others, you must be concerned with others, and so on. They should welcome this theory. The problem with, with a theory like this is, what happens if you don't begin to get satisfaction? Just suppose, then, is it okay not to help others? 
Whereas the non-egoistic theories will have to say, hey, it's still okay to help others. Is it okay to, uh, let's say, break the law? If you are not going to be caught, most of us do so. I mean, at least I rave and rant at my students. They will be strict followers of traffic lights and traffic rules if a policeman is standing there. But if there's no policeman around the junction, then, you know, it's everybody for himself. That's the way it goes. Okay, I don't know what it is in Bangalore, but just standing outside the gate of, of the institution, I can realize it's as bad, mm, trying to cross a road. Anyway, the point is that if you did not gain satisfaction from the action, would you still have to do it in order to be moral? Yes, we would say. Our moral conscience would tell us yes. Now let's get back to their own kind of ground and say, fine, what, what, what evidence do you have? You are putting this forward as a theory, correct? That the soul, the soul motivator, for the soul meaning the only, you cannot be motivated by anything else as a matter of fact. There is no other way that human beings are motivated. This kind of an extreme theory, what's the evidence for it? You need justification. This is not an ethical theory. It's a theory that comes from psychology. If it is true, it is, it is, a, it is a devastating uh, situation. But is it true? That's what we are going to examine, just very briefly. Um, one thing we can say immediately is, look, we do not desire only satisfaction, our personal satisfaction. We do desire other things that lead to our satisfaction. So satisfaction is not our sole object of desire. I mean, even when we are hungry, what do we desire? Do we desire the satisfaction or do we want the food? We want the food, isn't it? It's not, we don't want some neural connection to, to kind of take place so that our satisfaction is, uh, and when we are eating, what are we eating? We want to eat the food. We don't want the satisfaction. Yes, we do get satisfaction. And there is no harm in saying that by doing X, or we do X, we help others, and we get satisfaction. Always, even if you want to say that. But that's very different from saying you're doing X in order to get the satisfaction, which is what the psychological egoists want us to accept. We can accept the other position, that yes, we do X, we help others, we, we are self-sacrificing, we do our duty, and we get satisfaction out of it. There's no harm. That is not psychological egoism. Psychological egoism is saying that we are doing these things in order to get the satisfaction. And then we say, now please provide us evidence of that. One thing at least we can tell them is, look, there are very many things which we do desire which are not satisfaction. They are objects. They are primary objects, so to speak. We desire food, we desire shelter. These may result in satisfaction. They may not result in satisfaction. They may not result in But we desire them. And sometimes we may desire things that positively, you know, work against our satisfaction in the long term. We might say that drugs, drug abuse, substance abuse, smoking included, okay, bring satisfaction. I mean, I'm a smoker. But I know in the long run that when I have to walk up a hill, you know, I can't do that without a third leg, a walking stick kind of thing, because it, it's, uh, it's, it takes a lot out of you. So when you're talking about satisfaction, what are you talking about? Are you talking about an immediate thing? Or are you talking about your long-term satisfaction or what? But more importantly, I mean, the crucial um, problem with, uh, with such a theory is we ask them, what is the evidence that you have that you may not know, let's say, a certain gentleman in the middle of, uh, you know, nowhere, somewhere in the Australian outback, has been working with, uh, you know, the Aborigines, giving up everything. How does this psychological egoist who doesn't even know her name, never met her, how does he know that she's doing this because of the satisfaction that she's getting? He says, the only reason that he says is the fact that she's doing it. No. She's doing it. Therefore, she must be getting satisfaction out of it. I say, wait a minute. This is what you are assuming what you have to establish. Because if you didn't get satisfaction, you wouldn't do it. How do you know that you wouldn't do it? 
You say, but he's doing it, no? Yes, of course he's doing it, but you are assuming that he is doing it because of the satisfaction. And that assumption you want us to accept without any evidence, we say, sorry. You show us evidence that X is doing it because of satisfaction. In order to do that, you have to know X. You don't know X. You don't know anything of the work he's doing. You are just arbitrarily assuming that if a person does X, he must be doing it because he is getting satisfaction. Otherwise, he wouldn't do it. This assumption is not necessarily something that we have to accept. You've gone through a pretty elaborate exercise of how to evaluate arguments, and it is an assumption. Somebody else can come up with another assumption contrary to that. So ethical, I mean, psychological egoism, even though it might be very attractive, is based on an assumption that is not proved, not established. They don't even attempt to establish it. They just assume it. And the only evidence they offer is the fact that people are doing this anyway. Doing meaning what? They are not doing it for satisfaction. They are just doing the action. So how do you know they are doing it for satisfaction? They are doing it. No. What sort of argument is that? How do you construct an argument that has any kind of evidence? You want evidence. You are looking for evidence that X is doing Y because of the satisfaction that he is getting. And what kind of evidence is the psychological ego is providing you? Nothing. The only evidence is that he is doing X. But we want to know precisely why he is doing that. And you are not giving us any evidence. Anyway, let's, let's leave this aside. Um, ethical egoism, you know what it says. Very briefly, some of the problems with ethical egoism. See, it is, it is a genuine ethical theory. Don't think that it is advocating selfishness. Because you can be an ethical egoist, meaning trying to maximize your interest by being very altruistic throughout your life. Supposing you believe that it is in your interest to be self-sacrificing, then you will spend your entire life trying to be self-sacrificing, no? Because that will increase your interest. I mean, that will maximize your interest. So do not mistake ethical egoism for advocating purely selfish acts. No, it's not advocating that. It's just saying that in whatever you do, if you want to be moral, please ensure that your interests are maximized. What are your interests? They are not telling you that your interests should be only X or Y or Z. And a person can be an ethical egoist and yet be very altruistic, very self-sacrificing. All he has to do is to believe that in being self-sacrificing, he is maximizing his interest. Even supposing he doesn't get it in this life, then he might believe in the next life. He might be willing to sacrifice money, wealth, fame, whatever, in doing whatever he is doing, because he believes that his maximum interest is in being happy and singing the praises of God in the next life. Perfectly legitimate. He is still ethically egoistic, self-interest. What utilitarianism is doing is to generalize this situation. So don't look for your interest. You look for everybody's interest. And the slogan is, you might have, I'm pretty sure you've heard this slogan, the greatest happiness or the greatest number. You've heard this? The greatest good of the greatest number. This is by a gentleman called Jeremy Bentham who kind of uh, propounded first the utilitarian theory. It's, it's, it's fairly recent. It is a 19th century phenomenon. Now, if you are supposed to generate in all your actions, and this is common between ethical egoism and utilitarianism, yes? If you are to generate the maximum amount of satisfaction for yourself or for others, now I'm, I'm abstracting from whether it's utilitarianism or ethical egoism. But supposing you have to increase to the maximum possible your, uh, the satisfaction, then you must have a way of calculating the satisfaction, right? Because this is a question of which is more and which is not more. Between two actions, you've got to be able to judge that action A is going to have more, let's put it, units of satisfaction than action B. Otherwise, how are you going to judge between should I do A or should I do B? And Bentham uh, provided us, uh, attempted to provide us, with a way to calculate satisfaction. How do you compute satisfaction? Because you have to compute. If you're going to say you must aim at the greatest satisfaction 
possible of all the actions that you can do, you must aim at the greatest possible satisfaction for the greatest possible number. Talking about utilitarianism, then please give us a way to calculate. Now, satisfactions which are generated, he said, you can think about a number of uh, points. So we are talking here. It's called the hedonistic calculus. Hedonism is just uh, uh, another way. Hedonism is pleasure, correct? Pleasure seeking. But just expand that a little more. Don't take it too narrowly as just pleasure, satisfaction. Hedonistic calculus which means a way of calculating. It's not really mathematical in that sense of calculus, but it's just a, an index. If you want a measuring rod for how to know the difference between two satisfactions, then you can use elements in this calculus. You can figure out the elements. Between two satisfactions, how can they possibly differ? One can be more intense than the other, no? That's one way of making a difference between two satisfactions. Let's take the difference between what? Eating an ice cream and, uh, and meeting, uh, meeting your beloved. Isn't there a difference in intensity of the satisfaction? Unless somebody is uh, you know, so pathologically fixated on ice creams, we can accept that there is a difference in, in satisfaction, in the intensity, in the intensity of the satisfaction. So intensity emerges as one characteristic. You can have another one. The duration. How long does eating an ice cream take? What is the satisfaction you'll get from it? Five minutes, depending on how fast you can eat an ice cream and the state of your teeth, etc., etc. Okay? So that will be the extent of the duration. You go and watch a movie, particularly in the movie. It goes on and on and on. And if it is entertaining, then you've got three hours of satisfaction over there. So it purely in terms of duration, one will differ from the other. Okay? Duration is another ingredient in trying to calculate which satisfaction is more. Can you come up with other ingredients to evaluate satisfactions that can generate? be generated from actions. Pretty commonsensical, really. You, you figure these out. They're not too difficult, so add to this list. What else would, would constitute a difference between two satisfactions that are generated? Extent. The extent of the, the number of people the involved, satisfaction can differ, OK? One person eating an ice cream. Uh, OK, yes, you want to add? No. The issue here is whether we ourselves derive satisfaction or whether others derive it through us. Uh, sort of this, this, is, this is an interesting, both of what you said can be accommodated in, in the calculus that Bentham provided. One would be, uh, sir, yours would be an issue of extent, how many people are benefiting, and what Mam said, what we could call fecundity. Fecundity, all of us know, fertility. How, how productive, if you like, as, as Mam said, you know, we are satisfied. And this satisfaction is productive. We go to others and we, we, you know, we offload what we have learned over here, we share that experience with others. They are satisfied. So it is a fecund satisfaction. Eating an ice cream is not very fecund. You eat an ice cream, that's it. Somebody might watch you eating an ice cream and if you don't share it with them, it will be contra. You know, you might have a dissatisfaction, etc. Which, by the way, you also have to take into account, yes? That we will see. Side effects of, of the side effects. Yes, okay. Yeah, uh, no, what, what you've brought out is an important point of emphasis. The utilitarians are not saying only look at the positive side. They are saying you've got to weigh all the consequences, positive and negative. Excellent. You've got an, another point that, uh, that he would, maybe I'll write it here. Purity. Purity has nothing to do with any religious, moral sense of purity. It just means how much is that satisfaction mixed or unmixed with, with dissatisfaction. Like in this case, which Sir mentioned, I mean here, imbibing alcohol, okay, um, there is obvious satisfaction. He's not doing it as medicine. There is that satisfaction, but 
the long-term dissatisfaction is that he's going to be damaging his liver, depending on the quantum that you take. I think doctors now tell us happily for me that, you know, a certain quantum is very good every day. So these, these are uh, some, there are a couple of others. Um, one, one very important ingredient has been left out from the calculus. How it has brought in a kind of a, you know, the satisfaction, not momentary, but uh, in... As ma'am was saying, how fecund, how it spreads, its ripple effect. Um, apart from that, you know, what change has been... Change you're not concerned with. Satisfaction? Does it bring satisfaction? Fine. Everything else they're not concerned with. How to maximize the satisfaction? Because that is their criterion, no? We must aim at maximizing satisfaction of the greatest number. Then in terms of replicability or something of that kind, because then it's something... Rec replicability yeah. is the fecundity value. Okay. A kid, kid without uh, mental development, kisses the mother, yeah. the satisfaction of that kiss and the kiss of the husband. Yes. Yes. The, the intensity True. there, it varies. Intensity is different. So Very that's what I said. The intensity of loving, intensity yes. of possessing, yes. that, that also counts. <coughs> of course it counts. It's there on the board before you. You've got to evaluate it. You've got to assess it. Whether the kiss of a child or the kiss of your husband is more, uh, you know, intense. That's what you've got to assess. Sorry, yes. For example, you yeah. can take a painter's work, modern art or something. That painter is happy, but... Uh, I, I, as a part of an audience, may not feel impressed by it. I may not be able to understand the abstract behind it. That may not, I may only end up getting irritated Correct. because I have not understood. I mean, Correct. causes for irritation may be a lot. That's the downside, no? That also has to be taken into account. You are beginning to see one of the problems of utilitarianism. If you are to embark, but this is an empirical problem, if you are to embark on this kind of calculus, as I, you know, keep telling my students, you will never begin to act. How, first of all, how do you know all the consequences of your action? Do you know? None of us know all the consequences. We have to take into account all the consequences. And then we've got to evaluate them according to this. Now, this itself is complicated. There is a satisfaction to, to, to continue with what Mr. Nasruddin is saying. Okay, in terms of intensity, A might be greater than B. But in terms of duration, B might be greater than A. How are you going to compare them? When, when they differ on these kinds of situations, how do you get the net? Which is what the utilitarians want us to do. Generate a net total in order for you to decide. But that they have an answer to. They say, look, it's difficult. We agree. But ethical life is difficult. Moral living is difficult. So that is not so much of a problem for them with respect to uh, the theory. One other problem with uh, utilitarianism is if between two actions, supposing, hypothetically, both come up with all your tremendous calculation. There are a couple more items in this uh, calculus. We can add to them afterwards if you want them. But you can generate them yourself. Um, if A and B, two actions, which you have to choose between. Supposing, let us suppose for the sake of this thought little experiment, in utilitarian terms, they generate the same units of satisfaction, the same. Everything considered, yes, all ingredients considered, the net total of all the implications, etc., generate the same units of satisfaction. But one of them in involves breaking a promise. What will the utilitarian's answer be? How do you evaluate it? They can't answer that kind of question because they, um, their thing is you got to see the total level of satisfaction. We have assumed that the ingredients are the same. The satisfaction levels are the same. I mean, you might say, but that's a mistaken assumption. Your, uh, your statement would be as good or as bad as mine. My thing is only supposing that were the case. Then looking to utilitarianism for an answer is not going to be possible because they are saying you just got to calculate the difference in satisfactions. If there is no difference in satisfactions, how do you evaluate? Both of them would be on par, right? What would your common moral conscience tell you? That the action that does not involve breaking a promise is morally more acceptable than the one that involves breaking a moral promise, breaking a promise. So that's one of the uh, problems that utilitarianism has. The other one is what um, Professor Jung brought out, 
it is based on a conditional approach to morality. If you want to be happy, if you want to generate the greatest satisfaction, then you be moral. One Tom, Dick or Harry might say, I don't want to generate it. Then what? Then how do you still engage him into trying to be moral? Then a utilitarian can't again respond to that. Thank you. <laughs>